Good evening. My name is Emil Nakli, and I'm the director of the UNM Global and National Security Policy Institute, co-sponsor with Sandia uh, this distinguished lecture series, which uh, the uh, director of Sandia, Dr. Younger, will inaugurate tonight. Welcome to this first lecture that uh, both distinguished institutions have sponsored. Many people have contributed to the success of today's event. In particular, I would like to thank the director of Sandia Labs, Dr. Stephen Younger, and the president of UNM, Dr. Garnet S. Stokes for inaugurating the Distinguished Lecture Series this academic year. Uh, Dr. Stokes will, uh, she probably doesn't know it, but she will be giving the second Distinguished <laughs> Lecture Series in the spring semester. Also, I would like to thank our partners at the city of Albuquerque for filming the lectures. Uh, they have done a super job uh, for uh, w working with UNM and over the years. And you can see the video on channel 16, I think the government uh, channel here in, in town. I would like to single out just very few people to thank uh, for making this event such, such a success. In particular, I would like to thank Professor Edel Shamiloglu. Where's Edel? Uh, in the back, I think. Oh, that's Edel Shamiloglu for <laughs> chaperoning the entire process from A to Z. Um, Edel is the Associate Dean for Research in the School of Engineering. I would like also to thank uh, Gil Herrera and Diane Peebles and the senior staff at Sandia uh, for uh, helping making this a reality. Uh, Gil is also a member of the external board of GNSPR. <laughs> From uh, UNM, in addition to Edel, I would like to uh, mention Nicole Dobson, uh, Lori Peterkin, Deborah West in the in President Stokes' office, and Doug Zander Van in the Provost's office. Nicole is also, of course, in uh, the Provost's office. They have been very helpful uh, in throughout the process, and that uh, was standing outside welcoming people as well. The UNM Sandia Global Security Distinguished Lecture Series is another tangible step in the institutional collaboration between these two first-class institutions. The principal aim of the Distinguished Lecture Series under this collaboration is to highlight current topics in global security and increase community awareness of, of these topics. Hence, this uh, series open to uh, the community, not just to UNM uh, and to Sandia. Our UNM president, Dr. Garnet Stokes, in a few minutes will be introducing the speaker, uh, Dr. Stephen Younger. I just please allow me to say a few words about our own president. President Stokes was inaugurated as the 23rd president of UNM in May of last year. Soon after taking office, President Stokes initiated an innovative, multi-pronged approach to listening to students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community members, participating in more than 100 events during the first 100 days in office. In February, President Stokes announced the UNM Grand Challenges, which I thought was extremely creative uh, 
using our faculty and our first class researchers. Calling on both researchers from across disciplines to address problems of global, national, and regional significance. These challenges, by the way, comport very well with the broad definition of global and national security, which underpins the GNSPI. And also, these challenges comport with the spirit and goals of the Distinguished Lecture Series, which we will uh, inaugurate this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to call on our President Garnet S. Stokes to introduce the speakers. President Stokes. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here this evening. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Younger, Labs Director for Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, Dr. Younger has had a distinguished career serving in government and also in the National Laboratory Complex. Prior to joining Sandia, he contributed 34 years of distinguished service at the Nevada National Security Site, Los Alamos National Laboratory, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Dr. Younger was Vice President and Chief Technologist for Northrop Grumman Technology Services and served on the Board of Managers for National Security Technologies, LLC, the management and operating contractor for the Nevada National Security Site. He is also a fellow of the American Physical Society and has published extensively in atomic theory, plasma physics, anthropology, and national security. We are honored to have Dr. Younger here with us tonight. The University of New Mexico's location is unique in that it is unrivaled by any flagship university in all of the United States, with not one but two National Nuclear Security Administration labs, Los Alamos, which is 90 miles away, and then, of course, Sandia National Labs, which are just east of our campus. The Air Force Research Laboratory is also located right next to Sandia. Engineering, science, technology are enormously impactful in New Mexico and are important drivers of economic development in our state. The Sandia Academic Alliance seeks to further strengthen the UNM-Sandia partnership with Dr. Younger acting as a strong advocate for this state's research universities. Our partnerships are not new. We have a history of collaborating to build opportunities for our students, faculty, and employees. Both the Lobo Rainforest and the Applied Materials Lab are facilities that bring UNM students and faculty together with employees of Sandia National Labs to innovate new solutions and solve problems together. At Sandia, national security is their business. They apply advanced science and engineering to help the nation and its allies detect, repel, defeat, and mitigate national security threats. UNM's Global and National Security Policy Institute, led by Dr. Nakle, was established to educate future leaders in national security policy and support the mission of Sandia and other laboratories and government agencies. Please join me this evening in welcoming Dr. Stephen Younger for the inaugural presentation of UNM Sandia National Laboratories Global Security uh, Distinguished Lecture Series titled Looking Beyond the Numbers, A Century's Experience with Arms Control. Please join me in walking. Well, thank you, President Stokes, and thank you, Dr. Nakale, uh, and especially, uh, Emil, thank you for your contributions to national security over the years. Uh, you have been tremendously impressive uh, in what you have done uh, for our country. Uh, and thank you all for, for coming tonight. Um, over the next little bit, I want to talk to you, share some ideas on arms control, and in particular, nuclear arms control. 
Uh, it's interesting to do this at a university. Um, as President Stokes said, a university like this one uh, that is multidisciplinary, uh, that is multicultural, uh, that has two laboratories in its uh, neighborhood uh, with a focus on nuclear weapons. So the University of New Mexico is uniquely functioned to have, uh, uniquely positioned to have discussions of this type. And it's uniquely positioned because it is a multidisciplinary institution. Uh, when you're dealing with something like nuclear weapons, yes, it is the science, yes, it is the engineering, but it's also the history, it's also the political science, it's also the psychology, it's also the international relations, and all of the other disciplines that make for a great university. It's also an interesting time to have a discussion like this. Um, the United States recently withdrew from the intermediate range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, after repeated cheating by the Russian Federation. That treaty limited land-based short and intermediate range ballistic missiles that had a range of 500 to 5,500 5, kilometers. The New START Treaty that came into force on February 5th, uh, 2011, will expire in 2021. That treaty, limited each side to a maximum of 1,550 deployed strategic weapons. But the way they did the counting was a bit complicated and it did nothing to limit the number of so-called tactical nuclear weapons that in some cases have lower explosive force than strategic weapons. Now there's some discussion as to whether this treaty should be renewed or is it time to uh, negotiate a new one to replace it? Uh, and some people even argue that treaties of this type are obsolete. They have no role in a complex geopolitical future in which individual nation states are entitled any weapons that uh, they perceive necessary for their security. Uh, let me tell you, I view, view this as short-sighted at best. Um, a lot of talks on arms control start uh, with the present and try to predict the future. Well, you know, that's uh, what's going on in the world and how should the United States respond to that? And that's reasonable uh, since we're very much concerned with the future uh, and how we might shape that, that future. But arms control has a long history and has been conducted with varying degrees of foresight and skill. Uh, I am not going to go into a century by century review of arms control, um, but let me just say that we do have uh, the original documents related to some treaties uh, from Sumer, uh, which you can argue is the cradle of Western civilization. They're sort of 2700 BC. Uh, and it, they, these documents describe the tensions between nearby city-states and Sumer. Sumer, in case your history is a bit ru rusty, was in southern Iraq. And they had a few odd inventions like writing, uh, divine right monarchy, structural city-states, other odds and ends like that. I commend it to your attention. Um, but we have the documents, and uh, these documents display suspicion uh, they display going beyond suspicion to fighting wars, uh, similar things that we deal with today. So when people say that, oh, things have never been the way they've been now, that's usually wrong. Uh, if, in fact, things have been the way they've been now. Uh, the technology changes, uh, but there has been remarkably little change in human beings, uh, in human psychology. As a matter of fact, I would uh, uh, test you to compare documents from ancient Sumer uh, with those of Roman times, with those of medieval times, with those of modern times, people dealt with the same kind of problems. Uh, same kind of suspicions, same aspirations at the local level, at the family level, uh, and at the international level. So with this 50 centuries of history on how human organizations interact, we can learn from that. 
What can we learn from it? Um, if nothing else, we can learn how some previous efforts at arms control turned out. And spoiler alert, a lot of them didn't turn out really well. Um, <clears throat> now, another common feature of arms control was a focus on numbers. And that's reasonable since uh, treaties focus on countable objects like missiles, bombers, submarines. Uh, but there's much more to arms control than numbers. Uh, and indeed, a strong focus on numbers can actually distract us from our real goal, which is global and regional peace and security. So as an illustration of a past arms control initiative that was conducted with considerable skill, but which ultimately failed in its main objective, I'd like to talk to you about the Washington Naval Conference of 1921. You might say, well, what does the Washington Naval Conference of 1921 have to do with New START in 2021? Actually, a lot. Uh, the purpose of that treaty was to stop a costly and potentially dangerous arms race in battleships. And battleships were the strategic weapon of the day because they had the capability to go great distances and project force at those great distances. And you'd think, again, that, you know, how, to, how does a treaty that was intended to put limits on battleships relate to nuclear weapons? Um, I want to try to convince you that a lot of the arms control concepts were very similar between the two things. Moreover, we know how that treaty turned out, uh, and it, that was the Second World War, and we can learn from that experience. Now, before we get to that, let me go back to the previous war, the First World War, which raised... Uh, raged from 1914 to 1918, was a trauma to the social and political systems of the day. It was expected to last a few months, home before the leaves fall, started in August, or home by Christmas. Uh, young men rushed to recruiting stations because they didn't want to get left out. There was almost a notion that the world was bored this was exciting. Okay, well, let, let, let's do this. Um, parades as the troops marched off. People throwing flowers at uh, columns of troops marching off to war. Um, but then the reality set in. Uh, yes, there was the American Civil War. Yes, there was the Crimean War. Yes, there was the Franco-Prussian War. But it was the First World War that demonstrated the mechanization of killing. Uh, and it was a horrific experience to the people that went through it. More than 15 million people were killed, the best and the brightest of a generation that, that volunteered, that wanted to be the first to contribute, were killed. The German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire collapsed as a result of that. So divine right monarchy, which had been the dominant form of government for most of human history, took what might have been a mortal blow, although I contend the jury's out on that for reasons that I won't talk about tonight. Uh, you could argue that the United Kingdom never recovered from its human and financial losses. And well before the armistice which was on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Uh, talk about symbolism. Uh, well before the armistice was signed, there was a determination on all sides to prevent such a cataclysm from happening again. Sometimes we talk about arms control in an almost abstract manner. Uh, for the people of that time, it was very real. Uh, very real indeed. Uh, almost everyone involved in these treaties had lost a close family member, a dear friend. Uh, it's a little different from sitting in a conference room calculating numbers and remembering people who were killed in a war. So part of their determination, focusing on limiting another arms race that would contribute to a future global war, and just like today, there was an argument 
that arms that didn't exist couldn't be used in a war. Sounds reasonable. Arm, if you don't build a battleship, you can't use it in a battle. And just like today, governments were interested in saving money. Uh, battleships were expensive. And in particular, the European nations, uh, they were exhausted, as I mentioned, and Britain couldn't afford uh, to recapitalize its, uh, its fleet. So the initiative came from the United States. In 1921, President Warren G. Harding entered office with a strong belief in small government and a return to what he called normalcy, which was a code word for American isolationism. And this wasn't necessarily short-sighted. The world had just gone through this devastating war. And there were seeds of a renewed arms race between the United States, Great Britain, and Japan. Why Japan? Uh, Japan was a rapidly industrializing uh, country, uh, and they had taken over the colonies that uh, belonged to Germany before the war, so uh, they were an expanding empire. I'm gonna talk a little more about that uh, in a minute. But with regard, to the United States, the United States was protected by two enormous oceans, and the United States Navy had expanded very considerably since the turn of the century. At the turn of the century, the United States was sort of a coastal navy, and that was putting a good face on it. Uh, we did not have a significant seagoing navy. We did not have an understanding of naval technology. We couldn't build ships. Um, by the end of the First World War, uh, we were amongst the greatest navies in the world in terms of technology, in terms of reach, and so forth. So the Navy had expanded considerably. We had these two big oceans to protect us. So why did we need an arms race? Now, President Harding was a newspaper man, and he had a very keen sense of public opinion. So a few months after his swearing in, he proposed an international gathering to discuss limits on naval armament. And the resulting Washington Naval Conference was from the very start a work of diplomatic genius. First, Harding announced his intentions in the press. So he immediately puts all other countries on notice. Either you come to this conference, or you are peripheral to international affairs. Next, he staged what today would be called a media event. On the opening day, November 12th, 1921, there were crowds lining the streets in Washington to catch a glimpse of British Prime Minister David Lord George, French Premier Aristide Briand, Japanese Prince Tokugawa, representatives from many other nations. It was a media event. The galleries of Continental Hall were full of Washington's elite, members of the cabinet, Congress, diplomats, uh, editors, not reporters, editors of the world's leading newspapers were present to report what was seen as a groundbreaking international event. Anybody who was anybody was in that hall that day. Senator Charles, uh, rather not Senator, uh, Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes gave the first address and it was an electrifying speech. This was not a, you know, welcome to Washington and this is a very ponderous thing. No, he gave an electrifying speech. He started with a review of previous arms control treaties, notably the Hague Conferences of 1899 and 1907, noting that their failure led to the greatest war in history. It was time for a more determined approach. Quote, if we are to be spared the uprisings of people made desperate in the desire to shake off burdens no longer endurable, competition and armament must stop. He then set out to specify the path to naval arms limitation. There should be a 10-year holiday in the construction of capital ships for the United States, Great Britain, Japan, France, and Italy. America would halt construction on nine battleships, 
and six battle cruisers, even though some of them were almost done. They were almost within months of being done. The older battleships, so-called pre-dreadnought battleships, would all be scrapped, and a total of 30 ships would be sent to the breakers. Hughes went on to challenge the United Kingdom and Japan to take comparable steps. Reaction in that delegation bordered on incredulity, um, open mouth disbelief on the part of the British, literally open mouth disbelief. What are you saying? The New York Times reported that the Secretary of State sank more battleships that afternoon than quote, all the admirals of the world had destroyed in a cycle of centuries. Hughes concluded his remarks with a stark admonition, preparation for offensive naval war will stop now. And then he adjourned the conference for three days, nominally to give the delegates time to mull over his proposals. He, you know, he said obviously a lot more than that, and I'll describe some of that. What he really did was give the world's press time to stir up public opinion. Over the coming days, transoceanic cables connecting Europe and Asia with America carried a record number of messages. So by the time the conference was back in session, every member of the British and the Japanese delegations, which were the big powerhouses, uh, had heard a resounding chorus of support for Hughes's ideas. In the United States, Congress was united behind the idea of arms reductions, as was the public. Bishop William Manning preached from the pulpit of St. John Divine Cathedral in New York that the conference was, quote, one of the greatest events in history. During the next several weeks, the delegations hammered out two major agreements that were intended to reduce the threat of another world war. And here was another part of Harding and Hughes' diplomatic genius. Hughes recognized that simply limiting the number of weapons, battleships, was only part of the solution to easing international tensions. He knew that he needed to address the reason for those weapons. And the reasons were, from an American standpoint, the United States worried that Japan would fortify the island chains that it seized from Germany at the end of the war, creating a strong cordon to protect an expanding empire. Conversely, Japan worried that the United States would create fortified bases in the Philippines and Guam, which would be a threat to Japanese interest. The United Kingdom worried that it could not protect commerce from its far-flung empire, and it needed a large number of ships to do that. And oh, by the way, uh, if you would, would have polled the admirals of the United States in the late 19th century for who is the most probable naval adversary of the United States, it would be Great Britain, so-called Plan Brown to repel the, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and by the way, it was a remarkable turnaround for those very same admirals that when the United States uh, entered, uh, rather uh, just before the United States entered the war, well, let me pause for a second and tell you, there's a really interesting story, a document I stumbled over in the National Archives uh, a few years ago. And it was a three-page summary of why the United States had to join the Allies in the First World War. This was when the United States was still, still neutral. And it went on to say that um, the United States Navy is not prepared to fight the Germans. And if the Germans win, and it was looking highly likely at that time that the Germans would win, uh, then the Germans would likely uh, take some of the British fleet. They would come across the Atlantic. We knew that because we had their, their war plans, which we happened to find. Um, and uh, one of your predecessors, uh, perhaps. Um, we, we knew there were plans, and we, we have no chance of defeating them. So they could come up the East Coast and essentially do whatever they wanted, and they would have colonies in South America and Central America, and we didn't like this. So our job is to help the British win. Now, these are the same admirals that spent a lot of their career thinking of the United Kingdom as the enemy. And they said, well, times have changed. We've got a new problem here. 
So uh, just as an addendum, they stapled to the back of their two-page memo a third page. And that third page was a memo from the British Admiralty. And at the bottom of that memo was, God save the king. So I thought, this is interesting. Uh, these are uh, Anglophobe admirals. And the last thing you read in this document is, God save the king. But nevertheless, they realized that times had changed. Well, times had changed again in the 1920s. And you had to look at what was the objective, what were we trying to achieve? So Hughes reached a compromise that would freeze the island bases at their current status with the promise that they would not be fortified in the future. That is, Japan would freeze fortifications, we would freeze fortifications. Then he turned to the issue of limiting the size and number of battleships. And after very acrimonious debate, to say the least, the United States, Britain, and Japan agreed on a ratio of 10 10 6 for capital ships. The United States and Britain would have rough parity in capital ships, and Japan would have 60% in terms of tonnage. Now, similar limits were placed on aircraft carriers. The idea was to create a situation where no power could confidently attack another. Japan couldn't come across the Pacific to attack the United States with an inferior fleet, but it could easily defend itself against an American attack. The United States couldn't confidently expect to go all the way across the Pacific and attack Japan with no nearby fortified bases, but could easily defend the Atlantic and the Pacific coasts. Britain was an equal to America at sea now. This was not a happy thought to the British Admiralty, uh, but it was the best they could do after the ruinous expense of the Great War. Significantly, no limits were placed on aircraft or submarines. Now, the, the absence of limits on aircraft was partly understandable, uh, given three things. First of all, the technology was developing at a very rapid rate, so it wasn't entirely clear. You know, you reach an agreement today, and two weeks from now, it's obsolete. Uh, also, they had very limited payload capability, so they weren't really seen as a strategic threat, uh, and they couldn't go very far. Um, the absence of limits on submarines was a little more difficult to understand, given the fact that the German submarine force very nearly drove Great Britain to defeat. There are some declassified memos from the First World War uh, where the Americans assessed that the British were within a period of months from surrender. Um, interesting. But there were limits to what you could achieve in a single treaty, and you have to, to be realistic here. You could say, well, you know, we have to put limits on this, that, and the other thing. Sometimes things are just too difficult, so take what you can get. Uh, what they could get was an agreement on capital ships. So the Washington Naval Conference was a triumph of arms control diplomacy. It recognized that stability was a combination of geopolitical considerations, that is, preventing fortifications in the insular Pacific, and the numbers and types of weapons, both were required if peace was to be maintained. And that treaty set the stage for future agreements intended to reduce the probability of war. There were a number of additional naval conferences, the, the, the London Naval Conference of 1930 and some successors to that. Um, perhaps the most significant of these was the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928, which committed signatories not to use warfare to resolve disputes. So it really was a heady time for those who thought that they could negotiate the end of strategic warfare. All of those efforts were doomed to failure. The great naval historian Samuel Eliot Morrison referred to the Kellogg-Briand Treaty in particular as an attempt at, quote, peace by incantation. And that's, that's perhaps too strong a judgment. The world was recovering from the shock of a bloody war of unprecedented scale. The negotiators at the time were doing their best to avoid another such war. So it was an understandable position for the early 1920s. But by the end of the decade, the geopolitical situation was changing. And the fundamental shift was that not all countries were satisfied with the world as it was. And some saw military force as a means of changing the situation in their favor. In particular, Japan 
saw itself as a rapidly developing nation in desperate need of resources to fuel its expanding economy. Virtually all the raw materials used in Japan's industrial economy had to be imported. So why should the Japanese empire be penalized in the acquisition of colonies and territories simply because it entered the world stage later than Europe and America? So while the Japanese government, civilian government, supported the Washington Naval Treaty, many in the Imperial Japanese Navy bristled at being put into an inferior position. Uh, a senior Japanese admiral said at the time, war with the United States starts today. That is when that treaty was signed. By the way, there's some interesting revisionist history about those times, and I encourage you to read the original documents because the original documents give you a different perspective sometimes than histories that are written well after the fact. So Japan saw a strong navy as essential to protect and expand its interest. To limit the navy was to limit the future. And throughout the, the 20s, uh, in military planning, 20s and 30s, Japan considered the United States the, quote, hypothetical enemy in their planning documents. So in sizing its force and determining its tactics, you have to have some assumption of what you're going to do, you know, who, who is the enemy. So while Japan and America weren't enemies in a formal sense, um, the United States was used as a yardstick for comparison of Japanese capability. And we did the same uh, with them. And it's rather like the United States and Russia today. We don't consider Russia our enemy, uh, but we look carefully at Russian strategic capabilities in planning our own. And Russia does the same with us. The situation with regard to Japan and the United States was even starker than that of the United States and Russia. Japan knew that it could not defeat the United States in a protracted war. The United States had many times the industrial production capacity as Japan. The best that Tokyo could hope for was an early decisive battle. That was the term of the time. It was the decisive battle, uh, followed by a negotiated settlement. And Japan thought that the United States just didn't have the stomach for a major war. They thought we were soft. We went to the movies. You watch Fred Astaire. I think we're going to fight these guys. Um, Whereas Japan was a martial culture, they were disciplined. Um, so they, they didn't have a lot of respect for us. But on the other hand, some of them understood, uh, excuse me, look at steel production, United States, Japan, look at ship, shipbuilding, United States, Japan, et cetera. Uh, it's a little bit different. Um, but the, you know, the Imperial Japanese Navy had this idea of decisive battle. And they assumed that with an almost dogmatic rigor. By the way, they got the idea from us. Uh, Mahan, who wrote a classic book, The Influence of Sea Power on History. Uh, it's not exactly a page turner, but was an, it was incredibly influential at the time. And they, they bought it lock, stock, and barrel. And there were wild assumptions about American fighting forces. They were taken as fact by the Japanese naval planners. Um, but they were convinced they had to have more ships. And the Washington Treaty System, so carefully negotiated, collapsed when Japan withdrew in 1935. And there were concerted efforts to keep Japan from leaving the treaty, but it, it just didn't work. Now, the United States Navy had a very different approach during the 1920s and 1930s. The United States Navy used the interwar period as a time of strategic and tactical experimentation. You sometimes hear about battleship admirals, you know, fuddy-duddies devoted to the cult of the big gun and, you know, had no clue about the airplane or something like that. Nothing could be further from the truth. Few military organizations in history had the foresight and creativity of the United States Navy during the 1920s and 1930s. As early as 1919, the Navy's general board, that was the senior group of advisors that advised the Secretary of the Navy, the general board recommended the rapid development of naval aviation. They foresaw assigning aircraft carriers, which didn't exist at the time, uh, to fleets 
Uh, they weren't exactly sure where this technology was going, but they knew the Navy needed it. They led in the development of radio communications. The Navy was one of the first developers of long-range uh, communications, radio communications. They experimented with amphibious operations to capture island bases. Uh, they developed an extraordinary logistics capability to enable them to carry just about anything they needed anywhere they needed to go. And there's a great quote by a general whose name I've forgotten. Amateurs do strategy, professionals do logistics. Uh, it's a true thing for any of you who were in the military. Um, now, no new battleships could be constructed according to the treaty, but the Navy used every allowance the treaty had to maximize the efficiency of the fleet. And it was similarly innovative in tactics. Each year, the Naval War College would conduct highly detailed war games to test tactics, experiment with new technologies, and so forth. However, they went beyond that. They, they did a series of annual fleet problems. These were mammoth exercises that, in some cases, would use the entire United States fleet, cover thousands of miles. And they recognized that it was one thing to play board games. It was another thing to deal with breakdowns, bad weather, limited intelligence, and just human error. Um, by the way, each one of these fleet problems was followed by a um, vicious review. Uh, sometimes you'd have 1,000, 2,000 officers in an auditorium and they would tear their commanders to pieces. You should have known this. Why did you do that? We agreed that. Uh, intelligence indicated, uh, and normally, you know, if you're sitting there with three or four stars on your, sh three stars on your shoulder, people were fairly polite. None of those reviews, because all politeness was left at the door. The idea was, we're gonna be better next time. And they did dozens of these fleet problems. Now the result was that after Pearl Harbor, there were very few surprises for the United States in the Second World War. I believe it was Admiral Nimitz who said there were, he only had two surprises. One was the atomic bomb and the other was kamikazes. And the reason for that was the commanders had been thrown already, uh, not in paper games, but on the decks of ships. And they had been through it as a team. So one, command, one ship commander knew what another ship commander would do because he'd, he'd do the same thing himself. They had practiced as a team. The Japanese, uh, in contrast, relied on fairly well, relatively rigid plans. The United States developed a set of officers who would respond predictably to the unpredictable. That is, you didn't know exactly what the situation would be, but uh, the fleet would know how it would, uh, how it would behave. So whereas the Japanese relied on superior ships, and they did have superior ships in the Second World War in some cases, uh, the United States relied on superior tactics, not to mention a dominant industrial capability. And the result was victory at sea for the Americans. Now, as I mentioned, the development of the atomic bomb was one of the true surprises of the Second World War. It was thousands of times more powerful than any weapon of its time, and it was intended to shock the adversary into submission. Uh, many American senior military commanders, some of them didn't believe that the atomic bomb existed, even after we dropped it. They said, no, nah, you can't do that. Uh, others viewed it as simply another bomb. It's just more powerful. Um, it was the political people, the civilians, that understood that this was, this was different. Now, debate on the advisability of the atomic bomb's use against Japan continues to this day. I wrote a book about nuclear weapons a few years ago and in the chapter about nuclear weapons effects, I spent a bit of time reading firsthand accounts, survivor accounts of the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, particularly those that affected mothers and children, uh, those that you know, were certainly not part of the, uh, the war effort, uh, visited Hiroshima, stood at Ground Zero, went to the museum um, to convey a sense in my book of, uh, we're talking about serious stuff here. Some people say that Japan was near defeat and that the bomb was unnecessary. Um, we could have a naval blockade. Uh, honestly, our Navy worried that that blockade would take two years. It would result in massive starvation in Japan 
and the United States might have, not have the stomach for that. And then we'd be back at war in another 20 years, the way we were with Germany. Um, it's also worth noting, and again, this is a, a reason to read the original sources. Admiral Onishi Takajiro declared, and I quote, if we are prepared to sacrifice 20 million Japanese lives in a special attack, victory shall be ours. Now, this was after the atomic bombs had been dropped and after the Soviet Union had declared war on Japan. Now, Emperor Hirohito saw things differently and quite literally in the middle of the night outmaneuvered his government to accept surrender terms. Now, hardly had the ashes of Hiroshima and Nagasaki cooled when President Truman began to advocate controls on this new weapon. Curtis LeMay may have thought, oh, it's just like any other weapon. President Truman knew different. He recognized that armaments had crossed a fundamental threshold. Remember when I said, whenever you say things have never been like the way they are now, this was a time when they've never been like they were before. And the reason was he, President Truman recognized that armaments had crossed this fundamental threshold. With only a few atomic bombs, the very existence of a nation could be held at risk. This was a turning point in human affairs. For all of human history, only a few countries at a time had the capability to inflict major damage on an adversary at the strategic level. And the reason was it took a large army, a large navy to inflict that damage, and these were really expensive. It also took a lot of time to raise the army, develop the technology, build the ships, so that potential adversaries would say, hey, what are you doing over there? I don't like that, I'm going to raise an army of my own, I'm gonna build a fleet of my own. Nuclear weapons fundamentally changed that. They could be built quickly and in relative secrecy, and they could produce incredible destruction. For the first time in history, a small country could threaten a large country. The vast military superiority of the United States would be rendered obsolete. Truman reasoned that it would be better just to give up this super weapon or place it under international controls than to risk such a prospect. Unfortunately, Joseph Stalin did not agree. Stalin, and again, this is the notion of perceived grievances of how other people think. Stalin saw the Soviet Union as surrounded by enemies, not only of his country, but of the political system he considered the wave of the future. And to a certain extent, Stalin was not uh, a paranoid. He was a realist because everybody was against uh, that uh, political system, the communist uh, system. So Stalin thought that Nuclear weapons would level the playing field against the capitalist West, which had suffered relatively less in the Second World War than had the Soviet Union. And with a little help from Los Alamos, an early form of lab-to-lab -lab collaboration, uh, unknown to Los Alamos at the time, uh, the Soviet Union developed its own atomic arsenal uh, in a very short period of time. So what might have been a successful initiative in arms control was defeated by one country's refusal to accept it. And it wasn't an issue of numbers because there were very few nuclear weapons existing at that time. As a matter of fact, interesting, President Truman uh, was not on the list of people with a need to know the number of nuclear weapons that the United States had. Interesting thing. Um, so numerous attempts were made over the decades since the time of Truman to limit nuclear weapons, control the arsenals, spread, avoid their spread to other countries. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it since I, I know that some of you know that better, history better than I do. There was an agreement to cease nuclear testing in the atmosphere, in the oceans, and in space. There were limits placed on the size of underground nuclear explosions. Intermediate range nuclear missiles were eliminated, at least until recently. The sizes of the stockpiles of the Soviet Union and now Russia and the United States were reduced by more than an order of magnitude. Um, and perhaps the most successful treaty of their own, of them all, was the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was an agreement that where countries would forego nuclear weapons in exchange for the benefits 
of peaceful nuclear technology. Uh, tremendous success. Now, some of the best minds in the 20th century developed the notion of nuclear deterrence that governs our nuclear policy today. And these are people like James Schlesinger and Henry Kissinger and uh, a number of others. And the idea was relatively simple. They thought, if you have enough nuclear weapons, another country is not going to attack you because they would know that you'd have the capability to project overwhelming force in the defense of your national interest. So it was essentially telling another, another country, don't attack us because you're gonna lose. Now we may lose, but you're gonna lose too. So this is a lose-lose situation here. Um, several years ago, I was in a foreign country, and I won't go into details, uh, but I was in a foreign country and I was talking to the head of their nuclear weapons program. And I was with a US government delegation, and this uh, uh, head of their weapons program told a visiting senior US person uh, that his country had no interest in arms control. So this is a very seasoned US government person. And he says, why not? And the other guy said, because our country's been invaded twice in the last century, it's not gonna happen again. US government person said, but the probability of war is very low. To which the foreign leader responded, yes. And with our nuclear weapons, it's zero. Thank you. That's deterrence. Um, there hasn't been a strategic war since the introduction of nuclear weapons. The number of people killed in warfare, which was following a frightening exponential increase over the past several centuries, dropped dramatically after the introduction of nuclear weapons. This did not prevent, I don't want to say smaller wars, but non-strategic wars, which were incredibly destructive. Um, but it did prevent the kind of strategic wars that we, we faced in the 20th century. However, deterrence comes at a risk. It works when there are rational actors on both sides. It works when one side has something that it doesn't want to lose. However, it is not an ironclad guarantee that strategic warfare can't happen. Deterrence could fail, and the consequences would be catastrophic. Tens of millions of people could die, and the cultural legacy built up over millennia could be destroyed. We not only destroy the people alive today, we destroy all of the things that our predecessors worked for. So the question is, What's the greater risk, to have nuclear weapons and risk horrific nuclear war, or eliminate them and return to the savagery of the past? So today, we've seen, over the past decade actually, we've seen renewed calls for the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. Why maintain an arsenal that was intended to deter an enemy, the Soviet Union, that no longer exists? There's this visceral, visceral notion that if you get rid of weapons of mass destruction, the world will be safer. And it's not an unreasonable argument. After all, with no nuclear weapons, there can't be nuclear war. The question though is, would the world be safer without nuclear weapons? And compared to the effort put into developing the policy of nuclear deterrence, relatively little work has been done on the advisability of eliminating nuclear weapons. There's a, there's a visceral feeling, there's a lot of emotion here, but the, the kind of hard intellectual reasoning that went into the original theory of deterrence has, has, I would say, has not been done. Now, President Obama committed to eliminating nuclear weapons from the planet. But after that, um, one's hard pressed to point to a major government program focused on getting to zero. So uh, when President Obama was in office, I went around and talked to a lot of people. At the, I didn't talk to the president, but talked to a lot of people at the White House and the State Department and Department of Defense and so forth. And I said, hey, you know, the president said we're going to get rid of nuclear weapons. What are we doing? I didn't get any good answers at all. And a lot of the answers I got, well, it's going to take a long time. Well, it certainly will if you're not doing anything. Um, so, uh, and I think part of the reason for that is we're still grappling with that that notion of the advisability of eliminating nuclear weapons. In short, the compelling case has not been made. Now, some people say, 
that eliminating nuclear weapons will make the world safe for conventional warfare. They cite the carnage of the 20th century as evidence. This is what happens without nuclear weapons. And I respectfully disagree with both of these positions, that eliminating nuclear weapons will make us safer and that they would stimulate conventional warfare. And part of the reason for that is uh, we can't uninvent nuclear weapons. And even if we did, they wouldn't stay uninvented. We know that they are possible. A pre-nuclear world is fundamentally different than a post-nuclear world. Before 1945, the only means of conquering an enemy or intimidating a major power was the assembly of a massive army and navy, as I mentioned. So arms control treaties of the, uh, the type of the Washington uh, treaty system made sense. No weapons, you can't go there. Took time to build the weapons, so you'd have time to respond. But in the future, even if we eliminated all nuclear weapons, there would still be the potential for their reintroduction. We know they're possible. And given the current state of technology, they can be recreated relatively quickly by essentially any nation state that wants them. You see that in, in North Korea, by progress that's made in Iran, et cetera. Uh, and unilateral nuclear disarmament by, by the United States, to set an example for the rest of the world, could have profound consequences in tense regions around the globe. With the removal of the American nuclear umbrella, uh, would that, the question is, is uh, worthy to be asked, would that stimulate regional wars in Asia, in the Middle East, or even Europe? Different opinions on both sides of that. Would it stimulate a new round of proliferation, including by our allies who lose faith in the security of the American nuclear umbrella? Uh, and by the way, some of that proliferation could be in the form of virtual proliferation. That is, you do everything possible, but you don't install the detonators. How long does that take? About half an hour. Uh, so you, you're not a nuclear power, but for all practical purposes, uh, purposes you are. So it seems to me, there, I'm, I'm going to get back to the Washington Naval Treaty, by the way. There are several things that we can learn from that treaty. And first and foremost is the obvious maxim that nations act in their own perceived interests. Nation act, nations act in their own perceived interests. And by the way, the word perceived is vital in this phrase. What we think about another country's concerns may be different from what they think about their concerns. So Japan was hindered from obtaining vital natural resources, so it couldn't achieve its rightful place among world plowers. By the way, if you also read the original documents, it also felt a responsibility to bring its superior national culture to lesser nations around it. And you might say, well, you know, that, that's awful. But nevertheless, it's what they thought. You know, this is, this is something they should do. And by the way, don't look at, at it too severely because the, uh, the British could be accused of the same thing during their colonial times. Um, and the Soviet Union, of course, uh, deemed nuclear weapons essential to defend itself against the capitalist West. And Russia is saying the very same thing today. Um, other countries, I uh, had the opportunity to be in Baghdad right after the cessation of the, the major hostilities anyway. And I have some Christmas cards that I picked up from the floor of the Iraqi nuclear center in Baghdad that argue to the right of nuclear development. That is, nations have a right to develop nuclear technology. And in their case, it was, it was nuclear weapons. I was in the vault uh, where they had all of their uh, plans uh, for nuclear weapons. It was burned with considerable enthusiasm. The metal bookcases melted. Um, but um, that was their thought at the time. So there's no shortage of countries that believe it is their right, even their moral obligation, to achieve their ends by aggressive means. And focusing exclusively on the number of weapons may not be the most relevant factor if one or more nations are bent on aggression. Japan knew it couldn't defeat the United States in a protracted war. They attacked anyway. Now, applying this lesson today, you might argue that reducing the number of nuclear weapons or even eliminating them won't improve stability if done in isolation. Just as President Harding and Secretary Hughes recognized that limiting the number of battleships without dealing with the problems of the insular Pacific would not lead to peace, uh, 
so too should we realize that limiting nuclear weapons without, under, without addressing the underlying geopolitical tensions will not lead to the peace and stability that we desire. Tensions arrive because of perceived grievances. And unless we deal forthrightly with perceptions of grievances, we will not be addressing the reason for nuclear weapons. Now, some argue we have no enemies, we don't need nuclear weapons. That also, I think, is a simplistic argument it's because nuclear weapons are designed to deter existing foes. They're also designed to deter potential foes, that is possible, future foes. So the ultimate question, again, that we have to address in future arms control treaties is, is the probability of mass violence greater or less with the elimination or the significant reduction of nuclear weapons? And I would contend that we don't know yet because not enough work has been done. And that, again, is the importance of having this talk at this place where you have the breadth of thought to deal with these issues. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about reduction short of elimination in a minute. But with regard to the, the zero weapon option, um, I believe that it would be irresponsible to abandon a system that has worked well and continue to work today on the hope that things might magically get better. So without a compelling argument for the elimination of nuclear weapons, which have dramatically reduced the casualties in warfare since their introduction, I believe it would be irresponsible to eliminate them. Now, some people would say that globalization is erasing national boundaries. We are creating a global community. The probability of strategic conflict will decline because national economies are too interconnected to support a disruptive war. Now, there was a, a, an enormously influential book called The Great Illusion. It was published by Norman Angel in 1909. Uh, it went through, I've forgotten how many, huge number of editions. He won the Nobel Prize, by the way, uh, for the analysis. And his argument was that the cost of a modern war, 1909, the cost of a modern war would be ruinous. And even if a country was successful in an invasion, the productivity of the conquered territory would be low, so it's not worth the trouble. Um, he was right. The cost of a large-scale war was ruinous. But the First World War happened anyway. And by the way, after the war, the British paid the Krupp Company for patent infringement on fuses that the British used in artillery shells that they shot at the Germans. You cannot make this stuff up. Uh, so today's economy is indeed global, and people are better connected than ever before. But that hasn't stopped a rising tide of nationalism that harkens back to the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, let me quote a text from Albert Schweitzer, great humanitarian, uh, worked in Africa, greatest organist of his time, scholar. Uh, he had a, a PhD in theology. Uh, and in the introduction to the German version, uh, it starts with, when in future the history of theology lays open as a book before the scholar, it will be German theology that stands above all others, for only the German mind can. And he went on for an entire page. This is Albert Schweitzer in 1905. So I'm not sure Norman ever read Schweitzer's thesis. Uh, it was called The Quest for the Historical Jesus, by the way. It's still in print, a very influential book in uh, historical theology. This was Albert Schweitzer. <laughs> saying this. So if you wonder, how did this happen? Think about that. So a second lesson that we could learn from the naval treaties of the 20s and 30s was that stringent limits on weapons can actually stimulate innovation. Innovation on how to maintain stability without an arms race. The United States Navy was precluded from building new battleships after the treaty, but that didn't prevent a period of incredible innovation and experimentation. I talked a little bit about that. Now, the United States in the 20s was forbidden from building new capital ships, uh, so it developed a um, battleship life extension program. You know, the United States has a nuclear weapons life extension program. They had a battleship life extension program. 
And with the limits of the treaty, they put all kinds of new technology, radar and guidance, uh, rather um, aiming technology and all sorts of other things. And some of these things required more than one lawyer to, uh, to justify. Now today we have self-imposed congressional restrictions on new weapons. Uh, General Herensek a few years ago said, we're in the midst of a 30 year holiday in the modernization of our nuclear stockpile. We're not developing new nuclear weapons in the United States. We're refurbishing weapons from the Cold War. And the idea there is to set an example. We're not gonna develop new weapons. We don't want an arms race. We're setting an example for the world. Unfortunately, no other nuclear armed nation is following our example because every one is developing new nuclear weapons. And in particular, President Putin, um, who for all practical purposes the pro is the program manager of the Russian nuclear weapons program. Uh, President Putin has declared that the Russian Federation is developing and deploying a breathtaking array of nuclear weapons. There's a nuclear everything, nuclear torpedoes, nuclear doomsday weapons, nuclear cruise missiles, nuclear this, that, and the other thing um, that could destroy vast areas. So does that mean we should do the same thing? No, absolutely not. Uh, but it does mean we need to reapproach reassess our approach to deterring strategic warfare. It doesn't mean new weapons and it doesn't mean more weapons. It might even imply fewer weapons. It's not planning for nuclear war, but it's redoubling our efforts to assure that nuclear weapons, nuclear warfare never occurs given the tremendous advances in technology, society, and international politics that have occurred in the past few de uh, decades. Just look at what's happened uh, in the Middle East in terms of the Arab Spring. Look, look at what's happening in Africa. Uh, there are significant changes in the geopolitical scene. But just as the United States Navy experimented with aircraft, radar, et cetera, uh, understanding their potential and limitations, we too have to explicitly consider how the evolving technologies of missile defense, we're not there yet, but you can, you can sort of understand how and get there. Cyber warfare, how do technologies like that affect deterrence. The worst service that we can provide the nation is to sit idly by while the strategic situation changes and we don't. Then we would be the battleship admirals. Now, equally bad to being battleship admirals would be to hold on to those previous theories of deterrence that worked during the Cold War, but maybe aren't quite right for today. So the United States has recently introduced a lower yield version of a strategic weapon into our stockpile. And this has been criticized as making nuclear warfare more probable since destruction would be less. This is exactly wrong. The purpose of that lower yield weapon is to deter Russia from using its lower yield weapons that it has been very aggressively developing, quite impressive, over the past several years. Russia believes, and you don't have to interpret this from secret intelligence documents, I mean, they put it in the newspaper because they want you to know. Russia believes that it can use a low yield nuclear weapon to stop a conventional war. It's what they call escalate to deescalate. It believes nobody's gonna start a strategic nuclear exchange because we've used a small number of low yield nuclear weapons. And this is right out of the Russian documents that they give us, by the way, that they want us to know. And in particular, the United States wouldn't respond because all of our weapons are really big. Um, so what that low yield weapon does is tell Moscow, not so fast comrade, uh, we can respond in kind, so don't go there because we can deter you at any level of force, conventional, low yield nuclear, or strategic nuclear. It's another way of saying, don't cross the nuclear threshold at any level. And that's consistent with what I should, I believe should continue to be the United States policy of pushing the nuclear threshold into the stratosphere. Uh, if anybody tells you, well, we have nuclear weapons, why don't we use them? Or, you know, we could fight a nuclear war, uh, send them to me and we can have a serious discussion. We want that nuclear threshold to be in the stratosphere. Why? In our own best interest, because we have significant conventional forces and we believe we can uh, prevail on the conventional level. Now, should we have limits on conventional forces? That's a whole other talk for a whole other time. But uh, we want to deter conflict at any level, including some of the things that the Russians have uh, 
had advocated. We want to dissuade any potential adversary from thinking that it could gain an advantage by using a nuclear weapon. So in that sense, it's kind of foolish to think that the United States arsenal should never change. Uh, you know, we have weapons in our stockpile that are 50 years old or more. Uh, so you could ask, well, what about another 50 years? Well, maybe we'll evolve beyond that and have missile defenses or something like that and won't need them. But to say that you're never going to need anything different is a little odd in human history. So a third, and perhaps the most important lesson that we can learn from naval arms limitations, is that the goals have to be accompanied by solid, executable plans. I had a chief of staff once, an army colonel, who said, hope is not a plan. It's a great phrase. Um, Secretary of State Hughes and President Obama each laid out a grand goal. Secretary Hughes, in his opening address to the Washington Naval Conference and President Obama in a public speech in Prague. However, hope is not a plan, a goal is not a plan. What Secretary Hughes did is lay out a very detailed approach to achieving this goal. We're gonna limit battleships, we're gonna limit fortifications, we're gonna do these other things uh, to prevent hostilities from occurring. And it was a bold initiative, and it was intended to seize leadership on a vital issue. Um, our arms control uh, initiatives seem to be a little different than that. Uh, they're more measured. We've been at it longer. Uh, one might claim that the nature of our partners in the negotiations are different than in the Naval Treaty, maybe. Uh, one might claim that the nature of the weapons themselves is so different to argue for a more measured approach. Some merit in that. Um, but the goal of arms control neg negotiations is not more arms control negotiations. You know, it's not that, well, we're gonna negotiate this treaty and then we're gonna no negotiate that treaty. You know, that keeps the State Department busy, but the real goal is peace and stability in the world. So how do you achieve that? You have to clearly understand the consequences of what we're proposing, ensuring that they are improving rather than degrading international stability. So for example, every now and again, you hear proposals for a minimum nuclear deterrent, maybe 100 weapons. This is extremely dangerous. It recreates the worst elements of the Cold War by tempting an adversary to construct a worse, uh, uh, tempting an adversary to conduct a first strike. If the United States were to go to 100 weapons, an adversary could think, you know, I've got 100 weapons. I can take out enough of those that the United States were sued for peace. Or if they didn't, I can ride out the counterattack and I will win. Uh, that's a very dangerous situation because the theory of deterrence is no matter what you do, you're going to lose. Uh, the whole notion of nuclear deterrence would collapse. Allies could lose confidence in the United States, develop their own uh, nuclear weapons. Now, a counter is, and I mentioned a little earlier, missile defense. Could missile defense in conjunction with a small stockpile retain that stability? It's an interesting idea and worthy of study. But just as aircraft were not ready to replace battleships in the 1920s, so too is missile defense not ready to take the place of a strong deterrent today. When we have defensive measures that can reliably defeat a nuclear attack, then we can eliminate the weapons. Until then, we should think very carefully. Until then, nuclear weapons play in my opinion, an essential role in assuring peace. Now, another way of saying this is we shouldn't expect the future to be more stable than the past. There's no treaty system that you can put into place that will ensure peace and stability forever. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's said that human beings are inherently violent, that war is inevitable, and there's nothing that we can do to eliminate it. I believe that this is factually incorrect. Factually incorrect. Yes, human history has been scarred by wars across the centuries. But studies have shown that some small societies have managed to exist for many generations with very low rates of violence. So long story associated with this. But the, the punchline is, if violence were intrinsic to human beings, all societies would be violent. The fact that there are some, it's just not many, but some that aren't violent, that have maintained peace over a prolonged period of time, many generations, gives us hope. So it's rare to create that, 
enduring peace, but it is possible, and that's, that's encouraging. Now, problems with past arms control agreements. Okay, the Russians cheated on the INF Treaty. All right, fine. Does that mean we're not going to have arms control? No. It means that we have to look at what are our objectives in arms control? How do we optimize arms control treaties to ensure peace and stability in the world? How do we deal with the perceived grievances of the Russian Federation of China, of Iran, of North Korea, of other countries? It's doing what Hughes did and looking at the total picture. I believe it would be naive to assume that through some magic incantation in Samuel Eliot Morrison's words, through some magic incantation, we could eliminate violence from the world. The future is fundamentally dynamic. Stasis is not within the human condition. But we can aspire to stability. Nuclear weapons appear to contribute to that stability in a way that no other weapon has ever done. It's a curious paradox of our time that a true desire for peace must recognize, I think, the stabilizing function of these extraordinarily destructive weapons. In sociological terms, you might say they protect us from ourselves, from our own worst behaviors. They're certainly not without risk. Among a small number of rational actors, they appear to play a stabilizing role. Uh, proliferated amongst a larger number of unstable nations, they could spell disaster for the planet. Our challenge is to identify the optimum situation where stability is maximized and the danger of accidental or intentional nuclear warfare is minimized. I don't see a compelling reason to increase the number of nuclear weapons, as Russia is doing, nor do I see a compelling reason to decrease the number. We might even be close to or at a near optimum size for the American nuclear arsenal. And that's a great success for arms control. One of our challenges is, and this is a challenge for individuals as well as for nation states, one of the challenges is to recognize success when you get there, to accept it and to sustain it. It's not about the numbers of weapons, it's about the objective. I believe that arms control is as relevant today as it's ever been. Just as in the past, we need to look at a broader strategic context. We need to look beyond the numbers to the purpose. Now, none of these are easy questions. But I would contend that there is no question more important than this one because of the importance of these weapons to peace and stability, but the danger of these weapons in mass destruction. And I believe that this university can play a vital role in having careful thought and bringing careful thought and deep knowledge to this problem deep knowledge in psychology and anthropology and sociology and politics, and yes, in science and engineering, but really in human affairs. So I would ask that this talk be the beginning of a much needed conversation between the university and the laboratories. Thank you for your attention.